everyone, welcome back to Animal Wonders. I'm Jessie, this is Chango, and today I'd like to talk to you about birds, specifically parrots. We have a lot of parrots here at Animal Wonders, and we put a lot of work into keeping them happy and healthy. Over the years, we've made a bunch of videos on the basics of parrot care, and I thought it'd be a good idea to put together a compilation for those of you who are looking for basic information on how to care for your parrot. Now, as you know, parrots have different parts than humans, and some of their parts look pretty weird to us. So if something on your parrot is tripping you up and you don't know if it's normal, take a look at this video on parrot parts. I've gotten lots of emails from worried parrot owners who think that something is wrong with their bird because they didn't understand what's normal and what's unusual for a parrot. Most of the time, the thing that they've discovered is a totally normal body part. It's just different than a human, so it might seem weird at first. By showing you, I hope it helps you become more comfortable and relaxed with any parrots in your life. Feathers grow out of a parrot's skin similar to the way our hair grows out of our skin. New feathers are covered in a protective sheath and we call them pin feathers, like you can see on the back of Sprinkle's neck. Pin feathers have a blood supply to them as they grow, so they're also sometimes called blood feathers. When a bird grows in their new feathers, they can sometimes look spiky. Don't worry, the spikes will go away as the parrot grooms themselves, or you can groom it for them. Once the feathers are grown in, there are a couple different kinds. Contour, tail, and flight feathers are the main ones. This is Zoe the Red Lord Amazon Parrot. Let's check out her feathers. The contour feathers are the ones that cover her head and body. Tail feathers are these ones back here. They're usually wide and some can be extremely long. Her flight feathers are along her wing. The first 10 are her primary feathers and the rest to her armpit are the secondary feathers. And another type of feather is the down feathers, which are typically hidden by the contour feathers, but you can see one peeking out right there. To see the down feathers a little bit easier, you can move apart the contour feathers like that. Sometimes a parrot will itch or shake roughly and a down feather will pop out and float around the room. Don't worry, that's totally normal. Under Zoe's wing, it isn't completely covered in feathers like it is on the rest of her body. You can see some down feathers under there and on your parrot, there might even be some bare patches. This is totally normal too. Which brings us to another body part. Come here Zoe, touch. Parrot's skin. And if you look under Zoe's wing, you can see some bear patches. So many people mistake the look of a parrot's armpit and think that they're plucking. Plucking is when a parrot pulls out their feathers in an unusual way. To demonstrate what it looks like when a bird has been plucking, let me go get Joy. This is Joy the blue and gold macaw. See how you can see her skin on her chest and her upper legs? That's not normal. If your parrot has unusual patches of visible skin, then you need to talk with your avian vet to see why your bird is plucking and what you can do to help them. We do everything we can to make sure she's getting everything she needs to feel safe, happy, and healthy. Sometimes her efforts help reduce her plucking for weeks, and then sometimes she'll have a bad night and she'll pull them all out again. The next patch of skin you might see on a parrot that's normal is on their face. Most macaws have bare skin on their faces, and on Joy, you can see it's that white area. Joy also has little black feathers that make this unique pattern on her face. Other macaw species have different patterns. Some are fully feathered, and some have no feathers at all. So some bare patches are completely normal. Macaws have bare patches on their faces, and so do Conyers, but their bare patch is just around their eyes. This is Lulu the Half Moon Conyer, and Ecuador the Jende Conyer is his buddy who was being too loud, so he's in the other room. But here's a picture. They are different species, and you can see they both have bare patches around their eyes. And now let's take a look at his legs. The feathers go part way down, and then the skin turns into scales that cover his feet. Now let's take a look at another parrot part. Their beak. This is Chango, the lilac crowned Amazon parrot, and you can see he has a flaky upper mandible. This is totally normal. Parrot beaks grow in in layers, and some parrots will smooth it down on their own, while others don't. Then, if you look underneath, you'll see a kind of hole under the lower mandible. This is where their beak, a hard structure, attaches to their skin, a soft structure. What looks like a hole is just where the beak has an indent to allow them to move their throat to breathe, swallow, and talk. The upper and lower mandibles should line up, with the lower fitting nicely into the upper so they can completely close their mouth comfortably. If they 
can't close their mouth completely or their beak doesn't line up, pay a visit to your avian vet. The next stop on parrot body parts is going to be demonstrated by Ginger the Green Cheek Conure. If you're able to handle your parrot, you might end up feeling this hard bone on the front of their chest. This is called their keel. You can feel it, it sticks out. The keel is what their chest muscles attach to, which gives them the ability to flap their wings strong enough to sustain flight. You should be able to feel the keel, but it shouldn't feel sharp. If it does, it could mean your bird is underweight, but if you can't find the keel at all, it could mean that they're overweight. If you're feeling their chest area, come here, Ginger, and they've just had a big meal, you might discover a squishy area up here near the top. This right here is called their crop. The food is stored in the crop for a couple of hours before moving down through their digestive system. When the food is still in the crop, it feels soft and squishy, kind of like Play-Doh wrapped in a plastic bag. Their crop can sometimes get so full that you can see the skin between their feathers. This is normal and it should get smaller over the next couple hours until it's no longer visible. And our last stop for parrot parts today is the cloaca. This is their everything hole and it's right here. Poop, urates, uric acid all come out of the cloaca. It's also used for reproduction and egg laying. Determining if your parrot is a male or female is difficult because they both have cloacas and nothing else visible. Some parrots have distinguishing colors on males or females that make it easy to tell, but most don't. If you want to know if your parrot is male or female and you can't tell by their colors, you can either get their DNA tested by sending in a blood or feather sample to a lab. Or if your parrot lays an egg, you can be sure that they're a female. The cloaca should always have clean feathers around it and you should barely be able to see it. If it's red, looks inflamed, or there are large patches of bare skin around it, or if there's feces stuck to it, you need to see your avian vet. There are of course lots of other parts to parrots, but these are the most common parts that trip people up. I hope that this information helps you be a more confident and knowledgeable parrot companion. Aha, uh -huh, look at all those cuties. I love just seeing them being themselves. Now, one of the most common questions I get asked is what to feed your parrot. Now, there are a lot of different ways to offer excellent nutrition to parrots, and in this video, I show you what we do for the parrots at Animal Wonders. We definitely don't simply get a bag of seed mix from the grocery store. While parrots do eat seeds and nuts in the wild, they also eat a wide variety of other foods too. If we just fed them a mixture of seeds, they'd miss out on a lot of essential vitamins and minerals, which could lead to a drastically shorter lifespan as well as many possible devastating and expensive health issues. We feed all our parrot type birds twice a day. This includes the macaws, parakeets, cockatiels, etc. They get their breakfast a few hours after sunrise and dinner about six hours later. The reason we offer two meals a day is because I want to make sure they're eating their entire diet and not picking through a big bowl of food, eating their favorites, and tossing the rest on the floor. It's also natural for them to eat throughout the day and have periods of being hungry enough to forage and look for more food. So feeding them multiple times a day is a great way to encourage them to interact with foraging toys. So for breakfast, I offer a base diet of parrot pellets with no artificial flavors or dyes. The pellets have all their essential vitamins and minerals, so I don't have to worry about buying supplements or giving too much or too little. Let me grab their scale. There are many ways to make sure your parrot gets the proper nutrients, but offering a good quality pellet is the easiest. Get the first bowl on there, let it tear out. Twenty-four grams exactly. The birds get about 70% of their nutrition from the pellet. Some great pellet brands are Rowdy Bush, Lefebvre's, Zupreme, and Missouri. Alright, those are our big birds. Let's move on to our smaller ones. ones. You can see that these pellets are pretty boring and parrots are used to eating a variety of brightly colored fresh foods. So to make it less boring, more exciting, they also get a mixture of fresh vegetables in the morning. I cut up the veggie mix every three days and it includes carrot, zucchini, squash, broccoli, cauliflower, purple cabbage, and sometimes I'll add beets, kale, yam, or parsnip. I measure out just the right amount for each of them depending on their weight and the individual. A few of them need precise measurements. The rest of the birds get a half a tablespoon to a whole tablespoon each. 
That is for an Amazon parrot. Those are for some Conyers. Amazon parrot, Conyers. We've rescued a lot of parrots, and I personally know what the right amount to feed them is by offering them more than I think they can eat during the first couple weeks after they arrive. Then I watch to see how many leftovers they leave after two hours. I subtract that amount from what I offer them the next morning. After a few weeks of small adjustments here and there, I'll know exactly how much breakfast they can eat. During this time, I'll also weigh the bird to see what their heaviest weight is. It's not healthy for them to be at their heaviest weight all the time, but it's good to know what that heavy weight is so you have a good reference for a maintenance diet. Everyone is really hungry now, so let's give them their breakfast. So now that we're done with the bird's breakfast, I'd like to show what I do for their dinner. I pick out three to four different kinds of fruits. I like to switch it up every day so they never get bored. Today I'm going to be doing some apple, some pomegranate, and papaya. And then I add a few scoops of seed mix and mix it all together. I like to include whole seeds in their diet because it's such a natural action for parrots to crack open seeds. The seed mix isn't providing much nutritionally because that's taken care of with the pellets in the morning, but it's all about providing natural activities while also giving them a balanced diet. Health and happiness, that's how you get them to thrive. Now, most people aren't caring for 14 parrot type birds, so the way I prepare our bird diets won't look the same as most pet owners. The portions you might make will be much smaller and tailored to your bird's preferences, but the concept is the same. Provide a nutritionally complete pellet with fresh vegetables in the morning and follow that up with a variety of fresh fruits and seeds in the afternoon. This routine also allows you to take the fruit and seeds and use them as training treats throughout the day. The birds will get their full nutrition in their home, but still be motivated by the high reward treats you have to offer. The birds won't be ready to eat this mixture just yet, so I'll pop it in the fridge for later. And now I'd like to visit the macaws again and give them some enrichment. I'm gonna grab them some almonds and a few hazelnuts. Both Joy and Scarlet don't chew on their toys enough to wear down their beaks. So I also include hard-shelled nuts into their diet. I'm also teaching them how to forage for their food. So I am going to hide this treat. Joy knows how to open this up here. I'll put it in your bowl. Can you go get it? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, like I said, I'm still teaching them how to forage. So what I'm gonna do is make sure she sees the nut in there and then I'll put it in there. Go get it out. Ah, oh, you gotta get the nut out of it. You gotta get the nut out of it, see? It's in there, oh my goodness. Hold on to it, get it, get it out, you gotta hold it. I know. You're silly. You want me to do all the work for you. <laughs> all right, Scarlett, you want to give it a try? <laughs> yeah, you do? You like that? At least it's not scary, huh? You playing with it? Get it, get it. All right, here, I'm going to put a nut in it. You see the nut? Can you feel the nut in there? Get it out. Yeah, get it out of there. Is it good? I know you gotta get the nut out first. <laughs> All right, I'm also gonna try this other tactic. Just gonna take some strips of paper, put this in their bowls so they have to forage. Now foraging is very important because it helps activate their mental and physical wellness. All right. Ready? It's gonna be in there. Go and get it. Go and get it. It's underneath there. Can you find it? Good job. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, oh, Scarlet, did you get it? <gasps> no, it's still in there. What if it's covered? What are you gonna do? <gasps> Yay, successful foraging. Congratulations, Scarlett. Way to model that. Well, the macaws are enjoying their purchase. And this is just another way that I am enriching their lives and helping them thrive and not just survive. Oh, Joy's working so hard and she dropped the nut. You did so good. That was a really good try. Here you go. 
nicely done. An easy and nutritionally complete diet is an important part of enriching your parrot's life, and it makes me so happy to see our birds thriving thanks to a healthy diet. And while a good diet does help keep parrots healthy, sometimes they do get sick for other reasons, and it can be hard to notice since they hide it so well. I've cared for many birds in my animal career, and over that time, I've learned how to spot when a bird is not doing well. Take a look at this video where I share five ways to tell if your bird is sick. behavior tends to be difficult for many humans to read, partly because they don't have any facial expression and their bodies don't move like us. And birds are really good at hiding any symptoms of an illness, even if they're feeling really terrible. And they have to be in order to hide from any predator that might want to pick a slow, injured, or sick bird out of a flock. But the combination of humans' inability to read bird behavior and the bird's ability to hide any symptoms of illness leads to a big problem of sick birds going without medical treatment or dying from treatable ailments. So here are five telltale signs that your bird might be sick. Number one, weight loss. The best and easiest way to tell if your bird is getting sick is to monitor their weight. Everyone who cares for a bird should own a small gram scale with a perch attached, like this. Weigh your bird first thing in the morning, after their morning poop, but before they eat breakfast. This will give you the most accurate weight, and once you have this weight, you can weigh them daily, weekly, or monthly to monitor their health. Now there will be some fluctuation, especially if your bird is still growing, but if they ever drop more than 10% of their normal morning weight, you know there's something serious going on get them to a vet. Birds can be very delicate when it comes to illness, so you have to be proactive in their treatment. Make sure you have a veterinarian that's familiar with avian health. All right, number two, watch the poo. Birds have unique droppings, different than mammals, and <coughs> It can take a bit to learn how to read them, but watching their droppings is a great way to tell the health of a bird. It comes in three parts. The feces, which should be cylindrical, well-formed, and a consistent color. The uric acid, which should be white or slightly yellow and chalky after it's dried. And the excess liquid, which should be clear and only slightly dampen the area around the feces and uric acid. If your bird's droppings are black, bright green, or red, that could be a sign of sickness. If the feces portion of the droppings is not well formed, that's considered diarrhea, and your bird needs medical attention to treat the illness and prevent dehydration. Get them to a vet. Number three, take a breath. Watch the bird breathe. Their breath should be consistent without any sound coming from their nostrils. If there's a wheezing, whistling, clicking, or rasp, that's an indication of a respiratory infection, and they need medical attention as soon as possible. While you're listening, watch their tail. If it's moving up and down with each breath, that's a sign of labored breathing, which is also a sign of a respiratory infection. Get them to a vet. Number four, pretty bird. Birds only look pretty if they feel good on the inside. The quality of their feathers tells you a lot about their nutrition and the health of their organs. The feathers should be brightly colored and sleek. Many birds have an oil gland that they use to shine their feathers. Other birds have a downy powder used to coat their feathers. Either way, the feathers should look clean and vibrant. If their feathers look dull or drab, it's important to reevaluate their diet and make sure they're getting the proper amounts of nutrients. If their feathers have dark lines throughout them, that's a sign of malnutrition, and either their diet needs to be revamped or they're not absorbing their nutrients properly. If their feathers are overgroomed, plucked, or frayed at the ends, that could be a sign of mental or physical distress. If their feathers show any of these symptoms, get them to a vet. Number five, being weird. If you've had your bird for a while and you notice a sudden change in personality, it could be a sign that they aren't feeling well. It's important to never wait and see with a bird. Once they start showing signs of illness, it's already quite advanced. So if you think your bird is acting weird and might be sick, you know what I'm gonna say. Get them to a vet. The bird in your care is depending on you, so it's a good idea to always have an emergency fund in case they need medical treatment. It's no fun being sick, but identifying the signs early can help your parrot get the help they need for the best chance at recovery. Now, I get some great questions from viewers, and I love being able to answer them in a video where I can explain the answer in detail. And one of the questions I received was about grooming routines. So in this video, I walk you through the three hygiene essentials for parrots, bathing, nail trims, and beak health. In the wild, 
most parrots live in an environment that's very humid with lots of plants. Their feathers and skin are regularly cleaned whenever it rains. Many parrots have a natural oil that coats their feathers that helps protect them from getting soaked. They will slick their feathers against their bodies and the water will roll right off. But if they fluff their feathers out, the water can penetrate past the oily barrier into their downy feathers and their skin. This helps wash away excess buildup and keeps their skin and feathers in tip-top shape for flying and keeping them warm. Parrots can also rub against wet leaves if they don't feel like standing directly in the rainfall, or they can find a small pool of water and splash it all over themselves with their wings. Parrots that don't live in humid environments usually don't have oil that coats their feathers. Instead, they have what's called powder down. Cockatiels, cockatoos, and African greys are some examples of parrots that have powder instead of oil. If you're caring for any type of parrot in captivity, it's very important that you help them stay clean. If their feathers become too oily or something gets stuck on them like old food or feces, it can prevent them from forming a good seal with their feathers, which can let in cold drafts and they can get sick. One common reason for excess oily buildup on their feathers is from frequent petting by their human caretakers. Humans have oils on their skin and we transfer that oil onto anything we touch. The more we touch them, the quicker they get dirty. Having dirty feathers can also make them feel like they need to groom more, which can lead to feather destroying behavior, like chewing the tips of their feathers or plucking them out. Their skin can also become dirty from dander buildup, which gets itchy, and that can lead to the same problems of skin or feather destroying behavior. So the best way to prevent all of this is to offer them different ways to stay clean on their own. Many parrots will enjoy a splash in a wide and shallow dish of water. Other parrots love the stream of water from a shower. Some like a simple mist from a mister, and others will only use wet leaves hung on their home to keep themselves clean. If your parrot doesn't clean themselves voluntarily, then you need to be prepared to help them do it, because not cleaning them isn't an option. Please never use any kind of soap on a bird. Not only does it strip the oil from their feathers completely, but the fragrance in most soaps is toxic to birds. And if any residue from the soap is left behind, it's also toxic, and they can ingest it when they groom their feathers. If your bird is scared of the water bowl or the shower or the mister, then you'll need to slowly introduce them to the idea and to the objects, and then give them a treat for participating. Use whatever you need to to get them to participate in cleaning themselves. It can take a while, but it should become a fun and enjoyable experience for both of you. So while you're making sure they stay clean, you also have to watch their nails and beak. In the wild, their nails would be worn down as they move from tree to tree or perch on the side of a cliff or termite mound. They use their nails to forage and manipulate seeds and nuts with hard shells. In captivity, they aren't using their nails as much as they would in the wild, so they won't wear down as quickly. Some parrots can go long periods without nail trims, but most need their nails trimmed regularly. How often? depends on each individual. You can tell when your parrot's nails are too long by seeing how their feet rest on a flat surface. Their toes should touch the ground all the way to the tip and then their nails should curve up and rest against the surface or hover just above it. If the tips of their toes are lifted off the surface or the nail is turned to the side, it means it's too long and it needs to be trimmed. I do not recommend trimming your parrot's nails on your own unless they are trained or comfortable enough to do it willingly. We have a few parrots that accept nail trims while perched on my hand, like Zoe the Amazon parrot and Zapper the Alexandrian parakeet. I trained them to ignore the clippers and they're happy to participate as long as they get lots of attention from me. Some parrots take a lot longer to become comfortable with the process. If your parrot isn't comfortable with voluntary nail trims, you need to bring them into an avian vet for a trimming appointment. Going to a vet can be incorporated into your training plan. Either you or your vet can work with your parrot to get them comfortable laying on their back. For example, Lulu the Half Moon Conyer won't hold still for a nail trim while perched, but he is comfortable with me holding him on his back. This requires a lot of trust, and even if they lay on their back, they might not cooperate for a full nail trim. So your vet may need to restrain your parrot during the nail trimming appointment. Parrots do not have a diaphragm like humans, which means that if they are squeezed or restrained in the wrong way, they can't breathe. I do not recommend trying to restrain your parrot on your own. It's a huge risk to them if you don't know how to do it properly. I'm a trained professional trained by a vet, which is why I'm able to do it safely. If your parrot does not willingly lay back and relax while being restrained like Lulu, the last option is to use a towel to restrain them so they don't injure themselves or the vet during the procedure. This is Steve the cockatiel. He does not like having his nails trimmed. He also doesn't let me touch him, which is why he has pin feathers because he won't let me groom him off. We're in the process of training him to accept nail trims voluntarily. He does not like the nail trimmer. Here you go. Good boy. 
but in the meantime, his nails grow and he needs them trimmed. So the only way to trim his nails is to use the towel. Please do not try the towel method at home. It's really easy to do wrong. To learn this restraining method, it takes a lot of practice under direct supervision to learn how to do it safely and correctly. He needs his nails trimmed now, so let's go ahead and do it. Hi, bud. I know. I know. Very gently hold him. Now it looks like I'm just holding him in a, in a blanket in any which way, but uh, my fingers are placed in the exact places that they need to be to make sure that he can continue to breathe, but I also restrain his wings so he can't get them out and hurt himself or turn his head in the wrong direction. While it looks like I'm just holding him in a blanket like that, I'm doing it in a very specific way. All right, buddy, one last little nail here. And we're all done, ready? Oh, all done! You're okay, dude, I know. That's super rude. I'm sorry we had to do that. Would you like some treats? He's like, no, I'm really upset with you now. So restraining is not the best way to be able to do it, but when you need to trim their nails, it has to be done, which is why we work really hard to get them to do it voluntarily. All right, let's let Steve head on back. You did a good job, buddy. I know, I'm sorry. Most parrots in captivity will need their nails trimmed at some point, but there are ways to reduce how often they need it done. By providing a variety of perches of different sizes, shapes, and textures, and getting them moving around their space as much as possible, like foraging for food throughout the day, they will wear their nails down on their own. Another hygiene must is beak care. Parrots in the wild keep their beak in good health simply by doing their natural behaviors. Foraging for food, building a nest by carving a hole in a tree trunk or termite mound, and cleaning their beak when they need to. In captivity, most parrots never have an issue with an overgrown beak. They will use their perches or cage bars to clean excess food off their beak, which helps buff the sides. They will chew on toys and wear down the tip, and they will grind their top and bottom mandibles together and keep them aligned and just the right length. However, some parrots won't do these natural behaviors. If they don't play with toys like chewing on wooden blocks or woven perches, then they aren't going to wear the tip down. And if they don't grind their beak in the correct way, it can get longer on one side than the other, causing a malformed beak. Some people get concerned if their parrot doesn't buff the sides of their beak smooth because they don't think it looks as clean. But having texture on the sides of their beak is okay. It's completely natural natural and it doesn't need to be corrected. It's best if your parrot can take care of their beak on their own, and you can help them out with this by offering them a variety of chewable toys to choose from. If they ignore the toys, then hide some treats in or on them to encourage the parrot to engage with the toy. Eventually, they will learn it's fun to destroy things with their beak, especially if there's a treat involved. If your parrot's beak isn't lining up properly, you'll need to take them in to see an avian vet who can help realign their top and bottom mandibles using a Dremel. This is is not something that can be done at home. It's too easy to take too much off or shape it in a way where they can't eat anymore. You can also accidentally hit their tongue, which is incredibly sensitive. Never try trimming a parrot's beak at home. So if you provide your parrot with a way to bathe, a variety of perches and toys, and help them out when they don't keep up on their hygiene themselves, you're on the right track to making sure all their grooming needs are met so they can be a happy and healthy bird. Grooming is an important part of caring for your parrot, and it warms my heart to see well-groomed parrots living their best life. Thank you for watching this compilation on some of the basics of parrot care. I hope this video was helpful to those of you who have a parrot companion, or who are doing their research in hopes of bringing one into your home. If you have some parrot care tips that you'd like to share, leave them in the comments below so we can all learn together. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to keep going on adventures with us every week, subscribe to Animal Wonders Montana, and I'll see you soon. Bye.